Ready? Um, three, two, one. Give ourselves a little countdown here. So today, I'm really excited. Episode 24. I got Professor Rob Camito in the building today. Really excited. We're going to talk some chemistry. We're going to talk some New Jersey. Because before this, I was like on the internet browsing like all 50 st states like ranked. And the people's choice, they have like, so someone has a like C tier. I see someone like, I still on this website, like YouGov, they have New Jersey down at number 48. But apparently to like some other outlets, they have New Jersey at like seven and like nine. So what's up with this New Jersey slander? Is it really all there? Is it true? Or is it like the Northeast hate? Do you think? Well, so I, you know, I went, I went to graduate school in New Jersey and I also grew up in New Jersey and uh, my, my colleagues in, in graduate school were from a lot of different uh, states. And I got the, the usual tropes from them about New Jersey, but most of them ended up settling in New Jersey. So I think people kind of vote with their feet, regard, regardless <laughs> of uh, um, regardless of what they have to say about the state. Right. It's uh, everyone's everyone's getaway, right? They like to slander on it, but they'll go to the Jersey Shore or they'll spend time in like Jersey City and like the northern cities too, Hoboken. Um, I think it's a very underrated state. Because you kind of get a little bit of everything. I mean, I guess you're maybe missing like the mountainous areas, but you could just travel to Pennsylvania for that if you really wanted that, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so yeah, like you mentioned, you are from New Jersey, and yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, how did um, you know, growing up in New Jersey, and you know, just how did you get first get introduced into chemistry? Oh, you know, I, w I went to uh, to college interested in in studying biology, but I I got really interested in uh, uh, chemistry after taking organic chemistry and just um, falling in love with this idea that you, you you're kind of um, um, using chemical knowledge to to make something or to to build something while also studying its its fundamental properties. Hmm. Um, it's kind of the the best combination of um, a fundamental science, but also you have that aspect of of engineering or construction um, built into it. Hmm. And how so? You left biology. Well, so like in high school though, did you have any interest like even in high school or like, cause like, or you didn't even like know really about chemistry at that point? No, I mean, I took, I took a chemistry course in, mm. in, uh, like, like everyone does in, in, in high school. Um, I had just had, had figured I would go into, um, into biology. I had, I had done a, um, a, a program at Columbia university when I, when I was in high school mm. for, um, for people who who wanted to go study biology and or for high school students who wanted to study uh, biology in college and had had taken some courses on, uh, for for example, um, like immunology, um, a course on cell biology. It was just like a like a short um, special uh, topics course that I went to on on, uh, on on Saturdays, and I really enjoyed it. That kind of int introduced me to what uh, like a serious college level um, science course would be like. But, you know, like, like I said, my interest changed a little bit when I got to college. Sure. And did you have like a good teacher in high school for chemistry? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I feel like um, many people that, that don't like chemistry at first, mm -hmm. I feel like mo many of the times it's because they have a bad like professor. And so it's like, which is quite unfortunate because obviously I think it's the best subject, at least organic anyways. And mm -hmm. it's just quite unfortunate to, you know, a lot of people just, you know, crap on it really you know i don't know if you have any like thoughts on that like yeah well i'm so so chemistry to try to try to brand itself as as the central science it's um sort of as the uh, uh connections to all of the other uh, major fun fundamental sciences and it's also the most likely to directly relate to a job that that someone might want to get um mm -hmm. but maybe for that reason it seems more mundane to people you know you you, you don't necessarily um look to chemistry for wisdom you might want to look to chemistry to understand how like uh, a, a petroleum plant works or you know what what the di different types of soap are but, uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of hard to make that an, an exciting museum exhibit in the same way that say like dinosaurs or the planets or something something that you know you know what i'm saying it's, it's yeah. kind of hard to interface chemistry with the with the public without making it seem more um mundane well, especially because it's like, I mean, you know, we're talking about like molecules here that it's, it's nothing really, it's, it's many things that you can't even see most of the time. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's really not that interesting, I guess, with the eye, 
Um, but uh, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. Now, growing up, did you have like any other interests? Like, you know, some of your like hobbies that you still do now or. Oh yeah. I was a, I was a varsity wrestler when I was in high school. You were a wrestler. No wonder you're oh, so yeah. sturdy. You're a strong man, dude. Like you're kind of read it ripped. Oh, thank you. Well, it's, I like I, the thing, thing about wrestling is it's, um, um, you can be like, it's, it's like a tough or like strong sport for people who are small. Mm -hmm. If you're not too, if you're not 200 pounds, you can't be uh be like the football player. It, it, so you can still be a successful wrestler. Mm -hmm. Do you still keep up with wrestling now or like any sort of MMA or martial arts? Uh, no, I just, I try, I try to stay fit and that's, that's kind of all, all there is to it. What's your workout regimen looking like now? You kind of like, you working out like a lot or moderately? Yeah, I, 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 I invested in a, a body weight, a workout set up mm. in, in my, uh, uh, in my house when the, when the pandemic happened, because I couldn't go to, 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 to the gym anymore. Mm. And then, um, I had a, I had a son during the, during the pandemic. And so it, it, I've found that, um, having a gym in your own house is very convenient for, for time and all that. So that's, that's kind of what I do that and running. Running. How, yeah. how often do you run? You big runner, marathon runner uh, type? No, no, no. I just, um, I got a, I got a routine that goes through river Oaks. So I get to run past all the mansions. It's about three, three and a half miles. You're, you're dreaming about one of your houses down there one day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, having a baby during COVID, what was that like? I feel like that was like crazy. Um, yeah. So the um, the the early stages of of the uh, the pandemic when it was a very rough lockdown and mm -hmm. people didn't really know what the um, what the risks were. Um, there were a lot of rules that people were just kind of working with with what they had. So some some of the early um, OBGYN visits, I couldn't even go with my wife. Um, which was pro which was problematic in a lot of ways, but I think eventually they they realized that it's important for the fathers to be there. Right. Well, it's good they changed it up. <laughs> this is pretty crazy. I feel yeah. I mean, man, you talk about. I mean, you want to talk about a time like a pandemic? Man, that was two years ago. That's kind of, it's crazy. Um, and then some would say we're still in it, but like, man, and then having a child in that, I can't even like. Really exciting, but like crazy. But there were anyway. there were trade offs too because then I could I could work from home basically the entire time mm, when, he was, I, when he was very young. Yeah, I mean one of the silver linings I think with COVID is definitely like the the culture shift to working from home. Like, I mean you know on social media like, and I've I have friends who are like you know they don't do anything. <laughs> they literally don't do mm -hmm. anything throughout the day, and it's like they could do their job from home. And uh, there's the running joke where it's like, oh, we have great culture or we have great work atmosphere and it's literally like they'll buy donuts and coffee like once a week and like that's their culture or atmosphere and it's like <laughs> um so i'm glad to see we're kind of moving we're moving in that direction where it's it's okay to work from home i think people are more like seems like people's morale is going up seems that way to me anyways um but we'll see um how'd you get into wrestling though because i used to wrestle like in middle school and I thought really good outlet. It's definitely a really good outlet. I think for like, especially like young boys, but like, you know, how'd you like originally get into that? Um, you know, my, my grandfather was a, uh, I was, was a member of the booster club in, in town. I remember when I was very little, he used to take us to the, uh, to the varsity wrestling matches and he would work like the refreshments or something. Mm. So I got, I got to see it a lot when I, when I was a little kid. And you wanted to, did you get pinned a lot? Or were you were you pinning a lot of kids? Uh, I, I I was I was I was good. At, I was okay at it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did one, one a medal or two there. Nothing nothing exceptional. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Is it still hanging up in your 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 bedroom? You still got that medal? I probably have it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Did you uh, so did you wrestle all at New Brunswick or like when you went to when you went to college? It was kind of like you kind of gave up the the athletics and pursued education. Uh, I try. I tried wrestling a little bit when I when I first got there, but you know, I think when 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 you move to a different stage of your life, your priorities kind of have to change. Mm -hmm. And how was how was uh because you went to because you went did your undergrad at New Brunswick Rutgers New Brunswick yeah um so how you know how was that how was like you know did you did you do any lab work there like how did your uh, transition into chemistry like really um <clears throat> well just in events in general I suppose like how was that experience there. Oh yeah, I had, I had a great experience. They had a program at the time 
um, uh, that that still gave a lot of um, like merit based scholarship. So I got a very mm. generous scholarship to uh, uh, to, to go to Rutgers, um, and I ended up um, again. They, they they also had very generous policies uh, associated with the AP exams, uh, mm. which a lot of um, Ivy League schools don't. So you know, if 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 I if I had gone to an Ivy League school, you know, I might have had to start at the at the bottom with general chemistry or something. But no, I mean, at Rutgers, I was able to take organic chemistry my first semester. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of advantages to that because that meant that I was able to start working in a lab relatively early. Um, I got I got to do some internships in organic chemistry relatively early. Um, and, yeah, just my my career progressed relatively quickly there because of the, the opportunities. Um, probably the, the the best break I ever got was um, a, a, a professor there, a li little older guy by the name of uh, Spencer Knapp, mm. really, um, really took me under his wing. And um, he, he, he really invested a lot of time in, in, into me. And um, he got me some two really great internships, one at uh, Sanofi Aventis and one at, uh, uh, at Merck. I'm not familiar with the first company. company. What is that? Uh, so no, it's, it's a pharmaceutical company. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, I wasn't, I was doing uh, um, just SN2 reactions and whatever med chemistry, but you know, you have, you have to start somewhere and it, it, you know, it gave me, it gave me an opportunity to see what um, professional chemistry actually looks like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, yeah, especially, yeah, I mean, that's a great experience. Like <laughs> working mm -hmm. like under the wing of, you know, at like a real pharmaceutical company. I mean, I mean, that's a valuable experience and like, yeah, sure. The, the chemistry might be simple, but like, it's still like the people that you meet, you know, Mm -hmm. which honestly that's really what most things come back to it's like people you know honestly um but that's really cool i also didn't know that Rutgers, new brunswick is ginormous it's like forty thousand students right like i didn't realize it was that big yeah it is it's it's um it's i, I guess it's roughly twice the size of the university of houston um like i don't i don't know like why mass I don't know why it is student population wise oh, like undergraduate student population. oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. mm-hmm I don't. I don't know why that is. It might be because that's kind of the the only show in town. That the, the other um, like public universities in in New Jersey are a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a very large, very uh, very culturally diverse place. I'm trying to think of the other big schools. I mean, obviously, like there obviously there's Princeton, but like as far as the big public schools, so there's is TCNJ public. Uh, it is, but it's okay. Um, it's, it's a like primarily Princeton. undergraduate university, if I if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, and it's it's a lot smaller than Rutgers uh, at the time. Excuse me. At the, at the time, Rutgers had uh, Rutgers Camden and Rutgers Newark. Mm. Um, they might they might have some more schools now, um, but again, those are, those are smaller smaller things. Yeah, my cousin goes to Rutgers Camden now, um, but Camden's more or less just Philadelphia, honestly. <laughs> um, but the, I think Stockton is that a big school though? I don't know. But I think that's about it. I can't think of any other schools. Yeah, well, it, there's there's uh, uh, Rowan, William Patterson. Oh, Paul. there's there's a, a there's a yeah. long there's a long list of of schools there in New Jersey. Just no, nothing is anywhere close to the size of uh, um, of Rutgers, New Brunswick. Yeah. <clears throat> so, how did your work in undergrad like lead you to go to graduate school? So I feel like, at least for me, like I know that like I never like dreamed of going to graduate school. Like my my undergraduate advisor was like, "Yeah, you're pretty good at this. I think you should try it." And he was like. Also, chemistry PhDs are like paid for, so like you know, um, so like what was that? What was that kind of conversation like? Well, I, you know, I I knew going into undergrad that I wanted to do science professionally, so it was kind mm. of it was kind of a matter of finding the right career track. And again, I, having having been to the pharmaceutical industry, I I just basically asked them like what um what are the options and what did, what did you guys do? Um, and yeah, so you know, you you find out pretty quickly that the um um. You can you can make a good living um, with like a bachelor's or a master's degree in the pharmaceutical industry, but there's just kind of a, a glass ceiling. Yeah. So what I had kind of learned was that, um, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to complete a PhD, um, the opportunities that that'll open for you in, in the chemical industry are are pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So what was so because so you did your undergrad at New Brunswick, and then you know at least I know that then you went on to do your uh, PhD at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, so what was that? you know, you know, was Princeton like the, like your number one or like, were there other schools you were looking at or like, you know, how to, had that kind of conversation go? 
Uh, you know, I, I didn't actually, I didn't apply to as many schools as some of my friends did. Mm. I think I, I think I applied to something like six graduate programs. Um, and I got, I got into to four of them. And, um, um, at least at, at the time, Princeton wasn't that highly rated. So a lot, a lot of people thought I was making a bad move, um, certainly you know, compared to some of the other schools that I, that I had gotten into, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I had, I had actually recognized that, that Dave McMillan was kind of a, kind of a rising star. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, I, it, I, I had, um, he, he, he was actually very good about working stuff out ahead of time with students. So, yeah. um, like I, I, I talked to him and he said, you know, essentially like you come here, you can work in my lab. Um, so that, that, really was, that was the deciding factor for me. Plus again, it was, it was attractive being that close to home. Cause it's only, it was only 90 minutes from where I grew up. Right. And now you're halfway across the country, but yeah. Uh, so yeah. So that, yeah, Princeton, I was talking to, so I was talking to, I had Tony on the last episode and like, what do you like? I don't know how true this is. I'd like to get your perspective on this, but like, Princeton is, and many many of the Ivy League schools, like there is like top notch research there. That that is not to be understated. It is, but mm-hmm. like it's almost like some people that go there to those schools, like Ivy League schools or whatever, they're almost like afraid to say they go there because they don't want to come off as like pretentious. You know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. hard. Like it's like it's almost like you don't want to admit you're going there. You know what I'm saying? Uh yeah. So I mean, when when I graduated there. Um, they have this silly tradition in the Macmillan lab where they buy you a bunch of like tacky Princeton attire, <laughs> like, like sweaters and things. And uh, to be honest, I can't really think of a, of a setting where it would be appropriate for me to wear that. Y- you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's yeah, it's like, I don't know. Like, is the school is there like a is there a lot of school pride there? Like, like, you know, oh, yeah, you, yeah, for, certain, is it? certainly okay. on, on, on campus for sure. Mm-hmm. But you again, it's it's sort of like. Who's who's your audience? If I went to an alumni event, that would be that would be different. Yeah, but you ain't repping Princeton like at uh, Brunswick or something. I don't know New Brunswick. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know the, the um, we we were always told for for many years when I was uh, when I was at Rutgers that um, Princeton was their their big rival. That there was there was supposedly a, a history of, of football games between the two and between New Brunswick like, and Princeton. Uh, between yeah, between Rutgers and, mm. and Princeton, but. Um, but you know, when I when I when I started at Princeton, the the entire time I was there, I I, ne- I could never find anyone who was even aware that that Rutgers was their uh, their, their rival. Was their rival? Yeah. Well, isn't it true too that like isn't Princeton like the very first football game? Or am I making it up? I think that I think that is true. At least Peter or someone was telling me that. Um. Yeah. So the um. Again, that was that was part of the allure, the mythology, or something <laughs> that, that they told us at, at Rutgers. But I've. I've done some research recently and I don't think, I don't think that's exactly true. Okay. It's all, it's all hearsay. Mm -hmm. Um, Just going, so going back to like graduate school, I mean, for people that don't know, you know, you know, Dave McMillan, he did win the Nobel prize in 2021 and shame on me. I don't remember what he won it for. Honestly, I don't know. Do you, what did he win it for? Oh, he won it for organocatalysis. Okay. Do you want to just explain that real quick? Cause actually, or like, yeah, I'm going to let you go ahead and explain that. I don't really, because I don't know the nitty gritty details of that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a step back and say that the the, the wide lens uh, discipline that uh, I worked on in his lab is something mm. called organic synthesis. So that's just a fancy way of, of saying um, we use reactions that make things from some from something simpler. And organic, of course, being the, the, the part of chemistry which deals with compounds that contain carbon carbon bonds. And because of where most of the money comes for that kind of research, usually um, it has to be motivated by the synthesis of something which is related to uh, medicine or chemical biology. Yeah. So we're, we're making things that have relevance to uh, chem- chemical biology or, or medicine. And thus, most of his uh, alumni end up working in the pharmaceutical industry where they make compounds that can be tested for their medicinal properties mm. or they make things that... Um, or, they, or they, they, they develop better ways of mass producing pharmaceutical compounds. So that's, that's, the, that's the high level objective of, of what we're doing. Um, and one of the, one of the um, aims of, or sort of, sort of the ongoing aims is developing reactions that are more selective, that give you better control over, over creating complex structures. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, a, a, a particularly useful strategy to do that is, is catalysis. Catalysis controls 
the um, um, the reactivity of, of molecules through a um, a substance which is not consumed in the reaction, like mm -hmm. the catalytic converter in, in your car, it um, it sort of promotes a, a particular reaction at the expense of, of other reactions. Um, that's that's its its role. Um, and most of the, the catalysts that have been developed in the history of chemistry have been metal based, and they've been very useful. Again, like the catalytic converter in your car, but in, in synthetic chemistry, um, things that like you're you're working on right now, palladium catalysis, nickel catalysis, um, they've been very useful. But there's a particular set of reactions they work well on, and um, you know that there's there's a scope there that doesn't necessarily constitute all of the reactions that you will want to do. Mm -hmm. So Dave McMillan. Um, popularized this idea of using or organic molecules, so molecules that don't have metals in them, as catalysts. So he, he found ways to use things like chiralamines, that's just an, a nitrogen-containing compound, um, as a catalyst to promote selective reactions. Hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, so <clears throat> broad, broadly speaking, too, I mean, I don't even think, well, I guess... Broad, broadly speaking at like the high level, like, you know, we're talking like Merck and GSK when they do their reactions, very oftentimes do they not use transition metals in the catalysis? Because there really is like a, I mean, at least palladium, I mean, it's got to be on the order of like one part per billion, like something like that. You can, you ha like, you can't have more than that, like in your um yields or like you can't have that in like your products, right? Something like some really small amount. Yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll say right off the bat that I'm not a process chemist, but at least when, what from what I know about the background, um, a lot of transition metals have trace toxicity. And so if you use them as a catalyst in a, in a reaction to make a pharmaceutical compound, it can be difficult to get rid of all of the residue of the catalyst. Mm. And that, that can be problematic for, um, you know, side, side toxicity, actually, yeah. the, the, the the, the, the toxicity of the, the residual catalyst. Yeah. Um, transition metals are often colored. So there's a lot of, so it, it can be disadvantageous if you have some kind of whatever, like a green or a brown or something color to, to something that you make. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the avoidance of metals can be a motivation in itself. Um, you know, to what extent that's a problem in in process chemistry. I, I think you want to talk to a process chemist, but that's, 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 that's usually one of the advantages that are cited in, mm -hmm. uh, in the development of organocatalysis. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the last thing I'll say about it is definitely in process chemistry. If they can avoid using like transition metal cross coupling, whatever or whatever transition metal they're using, they definitely will avoid it if they can. Um, so, what was your role? Like, what was like? What did you work on in graduate school? Then, yeah. So I so I worked in an area that has been termed SOMO organocatalysis. Mm. Basically, what it is is it's um, you use a chiral amine catalyst, so nitrogen containing compound, which is um, which is chiral, um, and it's it's um, it promotes or it catalyzes a uh, um, an enantioselective reaction involving radical intermediates. Okay, so, so do we go down the rabbit hole of explaining chirality and enantioselectivity? I think we should because I think it's interesting. If you if you'd like to, yeah. So um, so <clears throat> biological molecules, including the the, the building blocks of of life, um, as we, and a lot of um, um, what composes the, your your body uh, has this property of chirality. So what the, what all that means is that um, it has a non superimposable mirror image. It's a little bit like your your two hands that are have basically the same um, structure, basically, but they're um, they're distinguishable from each other as mirror images of each other. And so what that means is that pharmaceutical compounds that are chiral that have distinguishable uh, mirror images can interact with your body differently. Mm. And so in over the last 50 years or so, there's been a much a, a movement in, in medicine and in the pharmaceutical industry to access compounds, um, which are enantiopure, which have only one uh, enantiomer. And that is a very difficult synthetic challenge, which um, one of the advantages of organocatalysis is that, um, at least the, the way that it was developed and promoted um, through the Macmillan lab was um, that they, they have developed a better um, a better way to access chirality or to, to, to access compounds stereo selectively. Yeah, the um, yeah chirality and enantioselectivity is huge, and I 
I think it's something that many people, um, I actually like to, to dive into it a little bit more because an anti-selectivity is such a huge, huge topic. Um, and that I think that a lot of people that, you know, don't do chemistry, like, you know, they've never even heard of it. Um, so yeah, like, like Rob was saying, you know, biological compounds, you know, things that are chiral behave differently within the body. And I think there is, I, there might be, there might be a Wikipedia link. I'll have to look this up, but like, you can look up like a compound and if it has a chiral center, you can look up, it's an antimer and you can see uh, the cytotoxicity and you can see the differences and how they behave um, in your, in your body. And, you know, how, how do these form formulaically they're identical um, but the way that they behave in the enzyme pocket is just, is different. Um, and so that causes major differences on the, on the scale. I believe, I want to say ibuprofen, like the enantiomer of ibuprofen, um, actually like basically makes you sick more or less. Like you, I think you get headaches or it makes it, something like that. Don't quote me. Actually just look that up. Honestly, people, if you're interested, I'm pretty sure it's ibuprofen. I could be wrong. Yeah. So to, 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 to use the analogy for, for your listeners, so like I said about your 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 right and your left hand being different from each other. So imagine mm -hmm. the molecules in your body all being right-handed. You know, if, if someone came up to you with a um, and offered you their right hand or offered you their left hand, you'd be able to tell immediately which which one they were offering because the mm -hmm. interaction, the sort of fit between those two um, is, is completely different. And it's the same thing with, with molecules you put in the body. You, 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 give, you put the right-handed version or the left-handed version, they're going to interact with your body differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, that's a much better analogy and definitely uh, more uh, suitable. Um, so you worked on that for a little bit. Um, any big findings? Like what was like some of your favorite parts about working in that lab and so chemistry wise, and maybe just like the atmosphere, like, you know, what were some of your favorite memories? Oh, yeah. So we, de we developed um, a very effective way to make um, uh, chiral um, sm small rings, um, hmm. to make chiral... Um, um, a variety of chiral compounds. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to avoid bringing up de uh, definitions or terms that uh, that, are, that I then have to explain. But um, yeah, it's okay. We, we, Listen, we, we can bring up definitions. Like okay. we got time, so you know, if we we can dive into this. Yeah. So I mean, one of the, one of the problems we addressed was the the challenge of of making uh, heterocycles. So this is a, a class mm -hmm. of compounds that um, um, the, the the bonds between atoms form rings, and the rings themselves contain uh, carbon in addition to atoms like oxygen or uh, or, or nitrogen, and uh, again these 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 represent types of molecules that are found in your body that are found in natural systems and are pretty well represented in medicine. So of course, being able to make them with control over chirality is um, a pr pretty enabling uh, uh, technology. Yeah, things like uh, I mean, I don't know, I don't. I mean, a good example is like you know morpholine, right? So that's a Morpholine is one, right? That contains nitrogen and oxygen. You have know, mm -hmm. things like indole, which is, you know, that just contains nitrogen. But yeah, there's a whole class of compounds um, that is, you know, that are heterocycles and they they are important. Um, so, <clears throat> so you, you said you worked on them or like you, you were, you had difficulty making them. I'm sorry. I missed, I kind of missed that. No, oh, I mean, they're, they're, they're challenging molecules to make that we found oh. a good way of, of actually okay. addressing Okay, and what was that? How'd you do it? And <laughs> by using uh, chiralamine catalysis. Okay, but yeah. um, but if they're heterocycles, I'm trying to think. Uh, how did you like? Where was where were you inducing the chirality? Like, were you like were these an anti-selective or? Yeah, so uh, they were ring closing reactions. So you start mm. from a molecule um, that's uh, linear, so all the the atoms are in a line. And then you got you kind of you use a, a reaction between two carbon atoms that kind of stitches the the molecule together, like taking a string and kind of tying a knot and mm. making making a ring out of it. That's good. That was kind of how we do it. But you know, you could think of like the an, an overhand knot is is, uh, is chiral if you look if you look at it carefully. So the, the 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 linkage we were making was also chiral. So you know, selectively making one knot versus the other knot is, is kind of um, again the, the the analogical way of describing it. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Now, going to so then you did your postdoc at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so people that do postdocs typically, I think, 
you kind of like, yeah, I'm going to go be a professor or something like that, right? If you're not going to be a professor, isn't it like kind of like not really worth it? I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I don't really know. I'm not really an expert on that, but. Well, it, it depends. So I, I, so first of all, I want to I say that chemistry PhDs are relatively short as far as PhDs go. Mm. So I have um, friends in the humanities and even in the life sciences, something like a seven year PhD is not, not uncommon. Um, so in, in terms of like, having to do a postdoc to get a, to get a better job or something. It's, it's not, it's not unreasonable and it's mm. not, it's not unheard of, you know, plenty, plenty of my friends got, uh, did postdocs before pursuing jobs in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. So what was, so did you always like knew, like, when did you know you like, yeah, I'm gonna go do a postdoc now. Uh, so I, I saw a postdoc kind of in the middle of my fourth year of graduate school. Mm. And I knew I wanted to do an out of field postdoc, which um, that is a little bit more um, the kind of thing you would only really want to do if if you um, if you wanted to be a professor or yeah. if you wanted to move into a different discipline. So, you know, you if 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 you if you know you want to go into the pharmaceutical industry, for example, well, you should you should probably do a postdoc that that gives you experience in that area. Yeah. Um, but for for academia, you don't necessarily have to do that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's it, postdoc could be sort of broadening your experience or your knowledge base. Um, and again, it's a, it's a, it's, it's another chance for you to broaden your network as well. Yeah. And so going into your, so what, like, what did you work on at your postdoc then? That's the next obvious question. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I worked for a um, younger guy by the name of Mircha Dinka. So he was, he, um, um, he studies metal organic frameworks. Mm. He has a, a very interdisciplinary program where he has people studying uh, reactivity in metal organic frameworks, and he has people studying um, more like physical or material properties in metal organic frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he he hired me with this this idea of of doing catalysis uh, in metal organic frameworks. Now I did move to uh, to transition metal chemistry at that point. We were um, we were putting mostly early transition metals like chromium, vanadium, and, and titanium in metal organic frameworks and using them for industrially relevant reactions like um, olefin polymerization. Mm -hmm. So the this this term I'm using, so a metal organic framework. Yeah, I was um, just going to ask. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a type of um, it's a type of solid that um, has a, a a porous but crystalline structure. So it has the, this property that um, material can flow in in and out of it. But uh, at the end of a reaction, you can remove it by filtration. Mm. And so it turns out that for a lot of applications in the chemical industry, um, having a solid catalyst is really key because it solves that problem of um, separation. So again, you don't necessarily want the, the catalyst to still be there once the, the reaction is over. Mm -hmm. Now, again, with, with the, 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 the trade-off ends up being that with solid catalysts, usually you can't get the fine level of, of control that you can get with a, um, with a molecular catalyst. Mm -hmm. so the, the chemistry I was studying with Dave, we were doing very, um, we, were, we were able to get very subtle forms of selectivity. Like I said, control over chirality, control over the position and a molecule that, that, that reacts um, because you have very fine structural control over the catalyst itself. That's a lot more difficult to do with, uh, with solids. So it's very difficult to get a solid, um, in which you can control the structure of the catalyst at a very like molecular or very like um, microscopic level. Yeah. Um, and metal organic frameworks gives you the opportunity to do that. So we were able to, um, we're able to, to, to get much more selective catalysts in, in the catalysis in the solid state with that class of, of uh, solids than you could with pre-existing classes of solids. Now, did you work? Did I assume you didn't work on like the applications of that, right? You were just kind of making them. No, I, so I that's I, I was doing the uh, the catalysis. Mm. Um, actually, it was so part of the reason why. I oh, didn't so you weren't study. making the moths. You were you you were using the moths. Well, so what I was both. doing was I was um, I was modifying metal organic frameworks that okay. By and most mostly, so I did I did some moth synthesis, but mostly what we were doing was modifying the moths. Um, after they were made and using them as, as the basis for, uh, for catalysis. Okay. Now what were the moths like useful? Cause I know, I know like some people use moths for like, you know, CO2 capture, like you could use it to capture gases. Um, 
so I'm unfamiliar with using moths as a catalyst. Like, so like, mm -hmm. what are the applications of that then? Well, so we were, we were studying olefin polymerization and olefin oligomerization. Oh, okay. All right. So ol olefins are, um, uh, organic compounds that have double bonds that are largely, that largely come from the petroleum industry. Mm -hmm. So they come out of the, the, the cracking process that tries to upscale the, uh, the gaseous fraction that comes out of the, uh, um, out of petroleum extraction. Mm -hmm. So lo long story short, our society has a huge amount of, um, of olefins, which are sort of accidentally produced or, you know, not, not, um, you 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 don't build an oil rig to get olefins. You build an oil rig to to make gasoline, but you get a lot of olefins out of the overall process. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the the goal of that um, um, catalytic application is finding valuable things to make from uh, from olefins. And um, yeah, those reactions when when they can be used used catalytically, um, usually there are it's a lot better. It, 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 it allows you to make something more valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so did, were those oligomers that you, you, you had made those, or they, I guess I could say polymers, right? I guess I could say that, right? Yeah. They're a type of polymer. Um, yeah, so they we were, yeah. So we were making uh, for oligomerization. That's just a technical term of saying we we're just taking um, two or a small number of molecules and kind of stitching them together. Mm. So we were taking uh, ethylene, which is just, um, it's what this, this the simplest, simplest double bond containing compound you can have is just um, H two C double bond CH two. Um, so you can you can dimerize that to make a, a, a compound called uh, one butene, uh, just a, a, a dimer, just two 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 of them. Um, and we were also polymerizing them, so making uh, things like polyethylene, which is um, which is a material widely used in consumer products and um, and in a lot a lot of uh, a lot of applications. Yeah. No, uh, there's no shortage of uh, polymer usage, uh, especially around here. Um, <clears throat> now, how is it like living? So, is MIT is that is that proper Boston, or is that like outside? Of it's a, it's in Cambridge, actually. So it's, it's right. across the uh, it's across the river. Um, you can you can go look up a landfill map of what uh, what the Boston area looked like uh, when it was first settled and what it's like now. And so, a huge amount of it is has has been uh, land, landfilled. But oh the uh, what's what's now the uh, what's now the Charles River runs through what used to be some massive estuary called the Back Bay on the other side of of, uh, of Boston, and so there's there's a neighborhood of Boston which is called the Back Bay, but it's just like the the, the area of the Back Bay that was uh, reclaimed and turned into into city, and then on the other side of, side of that they they reclaimed a huge section and that became um, part of of Cambridge that is that MIT now sits on. Yeah, that's interesting. Because Harvard's like right there too, right? I think we're like right across the street, or like uh, Harvard's two or three train stops away. It's it's not okay. far. Okay, maybe maybe a mile and a half, two miles, something like that. Is the rivalry there big? I guess among the undergrads. <laughs> <laughs> you, you weren't you weren't partaking in that. You weren't you weren't like berating the uh, Harvard undergrads. <laughs> never, never had an opportunity, I guess. <laughs> uh. But is so is is Cambridge though? Is that like I don't know, like I don't know what's the city life there? <laughs> like life there, fun. Um, yeah. So it's uh, they, they um they have this organization around something called like a, a, a square system. So like the the uh, the subway. Um, I guess it's it's one of the oldest subways, or it's the oldest subway. I don't I don't actually know in in, in the U.S. Mm. Um, so the red line kind of cuts across. Um. Um, Cambridge, and so there's there's specific uh, uh, squares. There's Central Square. There's uh, Kendall MIT, Harvard Square, and that's that's where all the, uh, um, the action will be, all the all the businesses and, th and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, it's uh, it's it's very residential. It is quite it is quite funny though. I know it's I know Cam I know like MIT and Harvard like aren't in Boston proper. They're in Cambridge, but it is kind of funny though. Like. Uh, you know the the Boston people. You know, crazy, crazy in a good way. But sport, there are sports fans there. I know the comedy scene's really, really, really good up there in Boston as well. That mm -hmm. and then you have like two state of the art like research labs there. So it's just kind of funny. Like I don't know, like having those two research institutes there, and then you have them like crazy Boston, uh, 
you know, sports based fans and like the comedy scene there, you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah. I guess there's, there's, there's a little bit of a rivalry between the, the, the so-called townies and toonies in the, in the Boston area. So like <laughs> people, who, people who grew up there and the people like the, the you know, yuppies like me who are just there for, uh, for professional reasons. That's okay though, because you know you could say the same thing when people come to Jersey. You know, like the, the, with I I've been called the Shuby before. You ever hear the Shubies? Yeah, yeah. You just you just go to the shore, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> repping, we repping. Um, if you yeah, so if, if you know the uh, uh, the the Affleck brothers, so Ben Affleck and, and Casey Affleck. I didn't know he had uh, a brother, but I definitely know his ben brother's Affleck. a little a little less famous. But they they grew up in that area. I don't know if, if in Cambridge in particular, but their father was a. Um, I uh, was a bartender at his place called the Cantab Lounge mm. in, uh, in 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 Central Square, and it's 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 kind of it's it's a dive bar, but it's it's like it's like a local dive bar, and it'll be right next to, you know, like the the sports bar that all all the, all the yuppies go to. And uh, but it, yeah, it, you, it, so he's 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 written a little bit about that dynamic, the uh, um, townies versus toonies. And I guess some uh, some some of his movies kind of play on uh, on that aspect of the uh, the culture up there. Yeah, I think I've never been up to like I never really been up to like proper New England area. It's definitely mm -hmm. definitely an area I want to get to eventually. Um, seems fun because uh, I mean, yeah, because uh, there's a whole bunch of guys there. I mean, isn't Matt Damon also from there? Like, oh, I and mean, the Good Will Hunting, right? Like that is Boston. Steve McFarland's from there, I think. Yeah, Mark Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg, another big yeah. one. Yep. Yes, yeah, so Boston's got a lot going on. I think Bill Burr is from up there too. So there's a lot going on for Boston, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, screw the Patriots. You know, we don't like that. Um, dilly dilly. You know, the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so okay, so yeah, you do your postdoc at MIT. Really fascinating. So how did you like? How did you stumble across uh, coming to Houston? Then, like, what was that transition? Like the job. How was the job search? Uh, well, it's it's very competitive. I mean, the um, the jump from postdoc to uh, um, uh, to a PI, at least at like an R one level school, is is a little a little bit like going from college sports to to professional sports. It's mm -hmm. you know in, in terms of like how many people um, actually have the the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a, I got a good offer. I got a good package here, and that, that's that's the that's what I that's what I took. That's, yeah, that's all she wrote. Yeah. Now, has it now being your own PI? Were there any like you know running your own lab? Like, what are some of the um, things you didn't see coming? Like, were there anything like you kind of like didn't expect as a PI, or like you know, has, or has it kind of everything kind of been what you expected? Uh, there's a, there's a learning curve for sh mm -hmm. for sure. Um, you know, when when you're when you're a postdoc, you only really have to worry about research. Right. You don't really have to worry about managing people. You don't really have to worry about you know finances and things things like that yeah and you kind of you kind of let you kind of let the politics you kind of let your your advisor worry about all that all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and how and like how's the uh the switch been like moving because you know i can definitely attest the the northeast moving to houston like you know how's that that switch been for you oh like what's the has the how's the cultural um readjustment? Yeah, everything oh, yeah. yeah yeah um yeah. I mean, it hasn't been. Um, I, you know, you 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 read the papers, and I kind of talk about Texas as if it's a if it's a different country. <laughs> and I don't think that's anywhere anywhere near close to 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 true. All right. Um, you know, you can you can live kind of the same middle class life down here that that you could live up north. Yeah. You have access to different kinds of groceries, and you might encounter people with some different different ideas, but it's not it's not that different. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a. Uh... <clears throat> Excuse me. Definitely is like. The one thing, like Houston, great is a great city, but you can't like walk anywhere. <laughs> like you know, you need to like drive, and the the public transportation like sucks here. Um, at least coming from the Northeast, you know, you have the subway, like subway and uh, trains, which are great. Um, and you can kind of you know you can traverse Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, New England, all relatively like honestly within a day, but. Mm -hmm it takes a day to drive just across Texas around here, you know? So it's like, you're kind of stuck here in some sense. Yeah, that's, that's true. So from, so from Boston, we could do very, very easy excursions on the, on the train, like an hour or so to get to, you know, Worcester, Salem, Plymouth, mm. um, 
you know, Gloucester, like all the, all the, all these, these places. Whereas here, if you want to, if you want to go to another city, I guess you could go to Galveston in an hour, but you know, like Austin is, is three hours. Corpus Christi is close to four hours. Dallas yeah. is four hours. It's definitely a, I guess you, it's not really a day trip. I guess Galveston could be, but you know, Galveston is. Yeah. Um, so what are we working on now then? Ah, uh, yeah. So I, so I, now I kind of view myself as a uh, as a synthetic chemist in a, in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. We go after problems in um, pol polymer synthesis and in small molecule synthesis using some catalysis, but not uh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I teach in the organic division. So I think pedagogically and um, um, institutionally, I, I still kind of view myself as as a as an organic chemist. Mm -hmm. But we do we do research involving new ideas in coordination chemistry, um, and you know with the with the structure and reactivity of of metals um, that has interest to to the inorganic communities. And so I, I apply for grants in some of those areas. I go to I go to conferences in that are more in, inorganic heavy as well. Mm -hmm. So like, what do you? So you're working on like polymer specifically, but um, yes, yeah, so like, what do you like working on like specifically though? Because I know like you do. Um, I guess one way to put it is like green polymers, I guess, if you want to use the, yeah, uh, the lingo. So we're, so we're, we're interested in um, polyesters. Mm -hmm. So things like polylactide or polycaprolactone, um, they have the, the environmental advantage of being um, at least, excuse me, more biodegradable than petrochemical based polymers. Mm -hmm. um, now that's, that's a, a whole conversation that I don't want to get into, but um, ne nevertheless, I think they're, they're widely, um, accepted as a sort of green alternatives to things like polyethylene. Um, and there's a lot of other applications that, um, their degradability might be useful. So a lot of biomedical applications, you can't put, you can't put polyolefins, you can't put, um, like petrochemical plastics in your body, for example, but you might want, you might want something that, um, is, you know, not only less toxic, but, um, which will uh, degrade and, and be, be absorbed by your by your body over time. Mm -hmm. um, but the pro the problem is again because of the um, the different types of synthetic methods that have been developed, it's just a lot more difficult to control the structure mm -hmm. of um, of polyesters, and that lack of control control over the structure makes it difficult to control the physical properties mm -hmm. of, of those polymers. Mm -hmm. So making making um, biodegradable polymers that compete with um, with petrochemical polymers um, is still difficult. Again, the, the analogy you might want to think of is like if you've ever had compost a compostable fork, you go to like some hippie restaurant that, that serves that kind of thing. It's like you know it's going to break so much more easily than the um, the mass produced plastic fork, and you probably had to pay a lot more for it. Yeah. That's kind of the pro that's kind of the problem we're we're stuck with. Is can you make um, can you make plastics that have that um, that feature of, of biocompatibility and biodegradability that don't cost more and you know break more easily? Yeah, <laughs> that's there's definitely a, there's, a, there's a limit. I mean, there, we 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 have to live with the the realistic consequences of a, of a consumerist society where mm. only a small fraction of people are ever going to agree to pay more for something that works worse. Yeah, the unfortunate society that we're in, but. Good thing we have people like you trying to work on fixing that problem. It's going to take a while, but you know, it's, we got to start somewhere. Can't just not mm -hmm. be working on this kind of stuff, you know? Um, now what about the other side of your, your research though? So you have, you have the polymers, but you also have a small molecule synthesis, right? Oh yeah. So we do, we do organic synthesis. Actually we use uh, UV vis uh, photochemistry. So we use um, light activation to promote the, uh, the synthesis of, of, uh, of small molecules and uh so for people that aren't aware of like chemistry like you you quite literally shine light i assume blue light or on these i assume blue yeah light or... so um so we use blue light or black light um so it's so essentially yeah, UV, black UV, UV light no, I yeah. just, you know that's to, to you to use the popular term like a, like a black light is really just a source of ultraviolet radiation yeah, yeah. it's I black you. because you, you can't actually see it um, but that, uh, that provides a source of energy for organic molecules, um, which leads to different reactivity than if you just heated those molecules. Mm. Yeah. So do you actually want to, um, so like what kind of, what sort of reactions are you trying to do then? 
you know, like what, what are the, what are you trying to make? Yeah. So we're really interested in the synthesis of amines. So those are, those are mm -hmm. nitrogen containing compounds. Mm -hmm. They're very useful in the pharmaceutical industry, but they're also, um, it, 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 would, it would also be interesting if we could append uh, amines onto, uh, onto polymers. Mm -hmm. So again, for the reasons I talked about earlier, uh, petrochemical polymers, um, they're cheap, they're, they're very strong, they have, they have good mechanical properties, but because they're very incompatible with biological systems, that some of their applications are limited. So it'd be great to, to introduce nitrogen in, 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 into those polymers in a selective way. Hmm. Um, so we, we have been accomplishing that using um, photochemistry. Now, so are you talking about like breaking carbon-carbon bonds and inserting like a nitrogen, like that kind of thing, or like? Uh, no, so... Uh, a, you know, a, a petrochemical product uh, is going to have a lot of carbon-carbon bonds and a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds. Mm. Uh, so we focus on the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Yeah, it certainly so is. Usually the, the, yeah, so usually the, the basic structure or the scaffold of an organic molecule is its carbon-carbon bonds. So you don't necessarily want want to mess with those, right? You want, if you, if you, if you want um, to take a molecule and like stick a nitrogen on it, um, you don't you don't want to to mess with its like basic structure. You want to kind of stick it on one of the the peripheral bonds, which is mm -hmm. the uh, carbon hydrogen bonds. Yeah, uh, it turns out that's that's difficult to do selectively, um, and we have we have come up with interesting ways of doing that. You want to? Do you care to explain how to do it? Because I think it's interesting. Yeah. So, um, one you know one of one of the things we've been doing is is using um, imines. So these are these are compounds that have carbon nitrogen double bonds. Mm. And when those are photo excited, it it turns out that they can they can do various kinds of rearrangements or substitution reactions hmm. on carbon hydrogen bonds. More or less like a CH activation, but without a metal. Right? That's right. Is that uh -huh. a way of, of describing it? That's really interesting. Where do you where do you see like you know those like the future of like that project? Like where do you like like what would be like your ideal? Like in a perfect world, like where does it go? Well, I mean, I, ideally, we'd be able to make, um, um, we, we'd be able to make amines with total selectivity over their their position, mm. their stereochemistry, um, their substitution, things like that. Mm. And you see, you also briefly mentioned because I remember Max talking about it in his presentation. I thought it was the but the coordination chemistry. Um, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Like, what are you working on? Because I remember, I remember something about vanadium, but I don't. That's all. About, that's all about. I remember. Oh yeah. So yeah. So we're so we're making uh, polymers using catalysis. Mm. So um, again, getting coming up with catalysts that have um, the useful features or the the, the useful level of control that mm. we want um, often invite it involves developing new metal complexes. You know, controlling the structure of the uh, um, of the metal complexes. Yeah. Cool. Well, Rob, I, I appreciate your time and, uh, thank you for coming on your, your consideration. Um, so any, any, uh, um, you know, advice that you want to, that you want to give to prospective students, um, whether that's your lab or just chemistry in general, or just life advice, do you want to lay some on? Yeah, I guess, um, if I wanted to start with a, a broad, uh, generalities, it's, um, you know, the sci science is not unlike a lot of other industries where um, if you want if you want to get your 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 start in it, there's um, us usually you have to be prepared to do very, um, very tedious or very boring things. I think a lot of undergrads that I've worked with haven't really gotten past that point. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, you realize that um, undergraduate research can be very frustrating because you're you're doing a very simple reaction, but it's not. Um, it's not that you're learning new reactions when you do that. It's that you're learning lab technique. It's you're learning things like um, how to communicate data or, or you know, how the, how the process of, of science actually works. Um, and I would say to anyone out there that's actually interested in a, in a career in science, um, you know, try to show a little, a little patience or uh, through, through that stage. Hmm. Um, try to uh, try to learn, learn what you can, uh, even if that requires doing something, which is, which might not seem uh, all, all that fun starting out because um, once you master those skills, you can start to do the more interesting things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, don't be, don't be deterred by those grades. If you like it, keep pursuing it. 
Um, because chemistry is a great subject. Don't listen to all the hearsay that it's hard. It's fun. Um, so thank you again for your time consideration. And uh, hopefully we'll have to do this again. I don't know. We'll see. If you get some results, we'll, uh, we'll have to discuss them in a future ep episode. But uh, thank you again. And uh, that's all, folks. Thank you.